Hello, everyone. I'm Allison Baksh, Marketing Manager at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's session is High Throughput Detection of SARS-CoV-2 Using COVID-Seq Next Generation Sequencing, Insights into Surveillance and Genetic Epidemiology. Our speaker today is Dr. Sridhar Sivasabu, who is the Senior Principal Scientist at CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology. This EK study will start with a brief presentation and will follow up with a Q&A session with our panelists. A special thanks to our sponsor, Illumina, for making this presentation possible. Dr. Sivasabu, please go ahead. Thank you, Alison. So today we are going to talk about a high throughput detection method called COVID-Seq, which is an NGS-based method for detection of SARS-CoV-2, and also I'll try to give examples of how it could be used for surveillance as well as genetic epidemiology. It's a well-known fact that the causative organism for the COVID-19 pandemic is the SARS-CoV-2. It's an RNA-based virus, and its genetic composition consists of over 30,000 nucleotides. Now, when we know the sequence of an organism, it can be used for understanding evolution of the circulating virus, it also provides a direct confirmation of the causative organism. It allows for molecular contact tracing. It also helps in understanding origin of the infection. It helps you identify community outbreaks. Of course, it does help in diagnostics, vaccine development, and therapeutics. So one of the things that we did way back in June was to set up a platform wherein we wanted to establish a high throughput detection method and also capture the genetic epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 using next generation sequencing technology. It was around the same time that Illumina announced COVID-Seq, which was the first NGS test that was approved by US FDA under the emergency use authorization. So this provided us an opportunity for undertaking the first clinical validation of COVID-Seq, which was done at CSIR IGIB in Delhi, India. A concept for the COVID-Seq validation, we selected 752 samples in duplicates and ran them on the Illumina Nozick 6000 using an S4 flow cell. So the basis of selection of the 752 samples was to ensure that we had captured the diversity based on gold standard, which is the RT-PCR, and we had selected samples that were positive on RT-PCR, negatives on RT-PCR, also samples that were inconclusive based on the RT-PCR results, and also samples that only had the e-gene positive, which according to the Indian regulatory authorities was called a pan serboco positive. We have also had a very good diversity of samples with a range of RT-PCR values, Samples that fell below the CT cutoff of 25, samples that had CT values from 25 to 30, and samples that were, of course, above the CT value of 30. And the reason why we chose this diversity was to benchmark COVID seek vis a vis the, its performance with uh, the gold standard RT PCR. In this slide, is the performance parameters of the COVID-Seq 
next generation sequencing test for SARS-CoV-2. So as you can see, we have tested about 1500 samples and we were successful in generating 705.6 GB of data with a pretty good Q30 score with a very high sensitivity of 98.4% and an accuracy of 97.29% and all this was done in about 12 hours time. So not only did we, were we successful in detecting the virus using the next generation sequencing method, we were also successful in generating whole genome sequences for about 469 isolates. And all this data is available freely on the bioarchive on the publications listed at the bottom of the screen for including the data is available for people to access. Findings, one of the findings that we had was that COVID-C could identify false negatives on RT-PCR, which provided us an additional diagnostic yield of 8 to 10 percent. As shown in the panel in the slide, on the x-axis is the genome depicted for the SARS-CoV-2 and the y-axis are the various uh, viral isolates. As you can see, we could pick up small portions of the virus and we were able to identify that the sample genuinely was a SARS-CoV-2 sample even though we could not sequence the complete virus. So it gave us an additional diagnostic yield of 8 to 10 percent which was very important to really go after every positive patient and be able to isolate them. The other interesting aspect on COVID-19 was that we could capture the genetic epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 samples. As you see in the slide, on the left hand side we were able to capture the various strains and the lineages of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and on the right hand side you can see the distribution or the percentage of the distribution across the uh, geographical niches that we have sampled in India. So, so this provided us a very valuable set of information on what was the composition of the virus that was in the community at any given time point and this could be used to drive policy level decisions which I will show you in a short while. So in the COVID seek assay could detect the virus and also provide information on genetic epidemiology. It had a very nice scalable configuration. You could do 300 samples at a time or 1500 samples or up to 3000 samples at any given time point. It had better sensitivity compared to RT-PCR. It had an 8 to 10 percent additional diagnostic yield compared to RT-PCR. More importantly, about 50 percent of the samples that were pan-serboco or one, only one, positive on one of the genes, which was the E gene, could be classified as COVID positive. And we could also derive additional information on the epidemiology of the infection. So this constituted a very nice set of proof of concept that led us to be the, globally the first institute to validate covid seek assay and like I said the data is freely available for people to review. Moving on ahead, I would like to highlight one particular case study from a state in India called Kerala. If you see the map of India, Kerala lies in the extreme southernmost part of India and usually a state which is flush with a lot of inflow of tourists. Also a lot of people from the state of Kerala uh, go back and forth for their occupation or their study to the Middle East or to the Southeast Asia. So a state which gets a lot of international travel and a state which has a very good track record of responding to epidemics and being has a very good public health system. So it was an ideal scenario for us to test the efficacy of COVID-19 in the state of Kerala. So 
as you can see here we collaborated with the government medical college in kerala kolikode kerala and we sampled three districts of kerala and the highlights were that all the samples that we could sequence were all of monophyletic distribution that means it was from a single clade of virus that was surprising given the amount of international travel that happens to this state it was surprising to see that it showed a monophyletic distribution second the viruses that we sequenced had variants associated with very high infectivity and multiple studies had shown that these particular variants were associated with high infectivity and this was also used to drive policy decision which i will allude to in the next few slides another important finding that was derived from the study what is shown in this slide as you can see on the diagram on the right side there are marked by three broad green arrows are the three introductions of the virus into the state of kerala and each of them could be very distinctly identified having originated from a neighboring state in india and we could also estimate the rough date of introduction into the state of kerala so this summarizes to to state that there were limited introductions into the state of kerala followed by local spread we were also able to use the data to conduct molecular contact tracing and be able to connect apparently unconnected outbreaks this was a very important finding and a very important application of covid seq for controlling epidemics so based on the findings the policy makers could take decisions namely the circulating virus in kerala because it was associated with variants that are high infectivity they could suggest aggressive measures to curb the spread of the virus the genomes also suggested interstate rather than international introduction this is very important because it provided evidence that the strategies that were being used for testing tracing and quarantine of international travelers were quite successful and the government could justify why they had taken such measures because there was no internal in, international introductions that were noticed and we could also use this data the genome data to build relationships between apparently unrelated clusters using molecular contact tracing and all this was done in collaboration with the government medical college at kolikode kerala and one can see how you could use genomics to drive pandemic policy decisions dr uh, sivasubu for that excellent presentation we will now move into the q and a part of today's session our first question is how can genomics help enable international borders to reopen uh, thank you alisa a very very pertinent question as we try to reopen the rest of the world and as commerce as economic hubs open up as schools and colleges open up you will see a lot of international travels so one we could use standard detection methods to see for the presence or absence of the virus but more importantly it would be one would like to find out where did the virus come in into a particular country or a state or a city okay when were the introductions done as i showed you in the examples of kerala clearly the government could use policies to point out that 
there were no interna in international introductions. Thereby, they could promote more tourism, more international travel. Therefore, I think genomics is going to be a very integral part to keeping international borders open, in doing molecular contact tracing, in finding out the epidemiology of this virus. So I think it's going to be a very important commodity in the toolbox to fight against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Over to you, Alice. Great, thank you. Our next question is, as countries in the Northern Hemisphere enter their flu season, how can we use genomics to understand co-infection of SARS-CoV-2 with flu and other respiratory viruses? Again, a very pertinent question. So let's assume that at some time point the SARS-CoV-2 would coexist and be, be present in a widespread manner. And as other infections such as flu and other viruses also start to spread in the communities, genomics would be able to differentiate between is it a genuine SARS-CoV-2 infection or is it a different kind of flu or is it a different virus that's causing the fever or the cold? So genomics can provide you information that a regular diagnostic test such as an RT-PCR would not be able to capture and be able to differentiate and identify the causative organism thereby enabling policymakers to take proper decisions. So I think it's a very important uh, tool uh, to, in the fight against SARS-CoV-2. Back to you. There are growing concerns on COVID-19 reinfection, especially on asymptomatic reinfection among healthcare workers. What are your suggestions to the scientific and public health community on this topic based on the insights gained from your team's research? Thank you, Alison, for bringing up this very important question. So we and others around the world have shown that reinfection does happen in SARS-CoV-2 infections. So earlier my group has shown how healthcare workers could be asymptomatically infected and is also subjected to reinfection. So this is a very important healthcare concern because healthcare workers are your primary line of defense who treat patients. So it's very important that they do not carry an asymptomatic infection or an asymptomatic reinfection. Because if they carry one, they will pass it on to other patients, their family members, and the community. So, first, the, the covid sick approach that I have just discussed provides a fantastic tool to be able to pro use in healthcare workers to identify if they are asymptomatically infected and if they are infected, it will allow us to put them under isolation so that they do not transmit it to others. So I think it's a very important tool in your fight against SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. And wrap it up there. Thank you, Dr. Savasabu, for that excellent presentation. And thank you again to our sponsor, Illumina, for making this presentation possible.